Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for making the time to join me on the podcast today. You're welcome. It's great to be here, Michael. Now, you've come highly recommended by many in our industry as one of the best practitioners turned coach and uh, have plenty of accolades to back that up. So, oh, that's lovely. For those of us not familiar with your career, could you give us a brief snapshot of what that looked like? Yeah. Sure. Well, I guess my career was like so many others, you know, uh, university and then straight into, like I I did three years of uni and went straight in as a graduate accountant um, in a a big firm. I was in a PricewaterhouseCoopers, so got a lot of my training, you know, really well in in that big, um, big firm. Uh, I was there for a little while and then decided I wanted to move closer to home, closer to my family, and um, and didn't want the commute every day. So I went to a mid-tier firm, which was Lawler and Davidson at that stage, now PKF Lawler in Maitland. So I didn't have that you know, 40-minute commute every day. Uh, I loved it there, and um, quickly I was given the responsibility of having a division in there, which was a small and medium-sized um clients so a lot of individual taxpayers a lot of small businesses which you know is what I love and fast forward uh, there so I was there for four years before I decided to go it alone and started my own practice from home and a CA practice um, which wasn't really that common you know having a business from home in those days no, those the people that especially yeah, for a female right that, like at that young age to go out on your own for, Yeah, so that's right. So I was 28 and, you know, most of those home-based businesses at that stage were people who had a job, a full-time job during the day and it was more or less, you know, something, you know, they were doing not necessarily as a hobby but something on the side. So, you know, for an accounting, you may have been an accountant at, you know, a a larger commercial accountant and then coming home and having a tax business at home. Helping all your friends um, and their mates and that sort of stuff, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and and word of mouth. And so that's probably traditionally where that home-based, you know, business where obviously we're so uh, familiar with it now and and everyone loves the benefits of having home-based businesses. So, um, and the main reason I started that was because there was no maternity leave policy where I was at and I really wanted to combine my career and not give that up um, but having children as well so in 99 I started and had my first son in March 2000 uh, and then my second son in 2001 yeah okay it's hard, so, hard to imagine a practice not having mat leave these days it's yeah it's, yeah. it's like a, a foreign concept now but a lot has changed yeah. obviously over the years over 22 years it's you know it doesn't seem that far no that long ago but yeah it's definitely now, now there are yeah, firms that's fighting what it was. now firms are fighting how to increase their policies you know like you've got the big four that are i think kpmg and deloitte they're always trying to increase it every single year it's like 13 weeks 16 weeks yes because yeah. um because so of the war for talent right yeah and you know there's um i think you know when i first went into accounting that it was very male dominated and mm. then you know going by the stats now it's actually starting to tip the other way 100%. so there is becoming more females in our industry um than males what was it like yeah. for you as a female trying to attract clients on your own out of your home environment kind of because mm. credit from a credibility perspective especially as you said like people used to associate yeah. their accountant or their, you know to be a partner wearing Being their cardigan male, male middle-aged, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I think I'd already established myself. So, you know, coming back to that hometown where I grew up, um, I'm the eldest of six children. So, yeah. you know, we had a lot of, we had a lot of um, people around us. We had a lot of connections. So it was probably easier, um, I guess, for me because of, of that connection, and, you know, involved in sporting, uh, sporting yeah. groups and other community groups. So that was probably okay. But I think I really established myself when I moved back to Maitland and worked for Lawless uh, because I was actually, you know, given the responsibility to head up that department and a lot of people came in. But I can tell you, and I had a phone call recently from a client um, who reminded me how upset he was when he was flicked over to me from the male <laughs> partner and he said, what? You know, I'm a girl. Um, anyhow, Can she even uh, count? Does she even know what a credit yeah. debit is? 
and I guess a lot of people did think that, you know, in those days, if there was a female, it was like the secretary. Mm. So anyhow, he, he ended up saying we had a very, um, you know, wonderful career. He was one of my first clients who came and um, stayed with me until I sold out, you know, 18 years after that. And as I said, he still keeps in contact. But he said that was the best thing that could have happened. You know, we had a really great partnership. And I think that was pretty much the when people actually, you know, were very hesitant at first, but then because they knew of the quality of the care, uh, it was actually a really easy sell. And so those people, when I was at Lawler's, referred clients on uh, to me. And then when I went to home, it was all word of mouth. So that whole business was built all of word of mouth. So I didn't okay. advertise. And we had the yellow pages in those yes. days. And I had a tiny little thing because it was so expensive to advertise in the yellow pages, a little you know, a couple of lines under the CA designation. That was pretty much the only way to advertise back then, yeah. Yeah, for people to find out your number, Mm. you know. And um, so, yeah, so it actually, I didn't find it that difficult because it was that word of mouth. And I think, you know, I established myself. um, What was your decision framework that made you go in a different direction to like what you, I think we talked about it before, like prior to mat leave policies coming into place, people would just, you know, become... A stay-at-home mum, right? That would be your other yeah. kind of alternative. Was there, like, did you have mentors Option. in place or people encourage you to go out on your own and, and, and take this path? No, I didn't. I just sort of figured, you know, I I had my parents, you know, worked for other people. My mum worked at the um, what Westpac Bank and my dad um, worked for um, the lands department. So they were just ordinary, you know, mm. uh, workers. So no, I hadn't come from a business background, a family with business background, but I had lots of, people around me that had businesses so people that I used to babysit for yeah. uh, and people that I looked up to so not necessarily even in the accounting space but I that entrepreneurial spirit and seeing what those people achieve seeing the quality of life and their lifestyle I guess all your clients actually was as well of, yeah and the clients that actually made me you know want to actually do that for myself and see whether or not and I had nothing to lose mm. because you know no maternity leave policy so getting nothing you know compared to actually going out and giving you know you know, backing myself and giving it a go, I was, you know, if it didn't work, I knew I had a job to go back to. So I guess people in my situation would have normally just taken that, you know, six, 12 months off yeah. and then decided to go back part time. So they did have a break uh, where I just decided to keep going and then, you know, gradually build that, that business up. Was there an issue with your practice, like, you know, Terry or anyone else that was there that said like, well, no, 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 you, you can't just go out on your own and, you know, you, you can't take our clients and all of that sort of stuff. No, they were really, in, they were fine, you know, they were really encouraging. I mean, obviously, they would have loved me to stay, um, but I, I went with their blessing and, in fact, they did say that they would actually, you know, come to an arrangement uh, with me, but there was nothing in writing. Like, at that stage when we started talking, there was nothing in writing and I just figured I didn't really want to be a guinea pig in that situation. I just really wanted to enjoy my kids and, you know, and enjoy being a mum but then still, you know, have the business and be able to still service my clients. And, you know, also thinking about GST was about to come in. Yeah. So I had a lot of people that didn't need that um, help and I knew I could help them. So, um, but they were very encouraging. So I could think for the first six months, I actually contracted back to them about 20 hours a week. So that's, I guess, the level of um, So you had some certainty had. there did, as well, income-wise. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, so the, I wasn't leaving them in the lurch because it was July. So they actually gave me, you know, 20 hours a week, so I'd go over there every Monday and deliver the work and bring more home. Oh, you were basically the early, that, the early school days of uh, remote working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I would go over there. No paper. It was all paper. <laughs> it was all paper. Files, and yep. I had big, but I guess that was really, you know, that was that was the way it worked and I, I did agree with them which clients I was going to take because, you know, whether I brought them to the firm or there was an existing, you know, family relationship and they were happy with that and then uh, clients then started to follow and then that sort of built up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, so very amicable and I see them all today still. You have to. Still, it's a small you know, place. <laughs> I Yeah, so I still have a very good relationship with um, the guys, yeah, from um, from Lawless. Yeah, okay. Um Question for you. What made you get into accounting to begin with? What made me get into accounting? Um, I was good at maths, good <laughs> at numbers. Uh, I think I wanted to have a career that um, paid well. And, you know, back in those days, accountants were paid. You know, they still are. Uh, but, you know, they were very, very well paid, very um, highly respected in the community. So I, I really liked that. And I think, you know, loving 
you know, loving business, loving the people that I was, you know, you know, um, associated with from that, you know, babysitting and just other people. I really just wanted to, I really thought that was going to be fun. So, um, my mum would often do people's tax returns. She was very good with numbers as well as so working okay. in the bank. She didn't have any accounting background or any formal training, but she would often be sitting at the table at tax time doing everyone's tax returns. I thought that was pretty pretty fun. <laughs> and just, you know, loved loved business, loved, you know, the entrepreneurial side of things and just loved talking to people and helping them. Mm, okay. I guess. I, know you know, you, I noticed yeah. on your LinkedIn you had a, a little stint into academia as well. Um, was that yes, was that a direction so, you were considering taking before going into public it practice? It probably was in a little space. So what I did there, um, so in my third year of uni, I actually became a research assistant for the professor of accounting. So it was a bit of a part-time job. And uh, he loved having me there. So he actually offered me a, a job the first year out. So I stayed actually working for him as a research assistant and for the other members of the department for quite some time. And then I got into teaching and was doing tutoring there as well, in addition yeah. to being that research assistant. So that was probably an option, but um, how I how actually I ended up getting out of there, I was doing a tutor with someone who uh, their husband was a partner at Pricewaterhouse. <laughs> and I was doing a sort of a tutor for someone else and they came the following week and said to me, uh, look, would you like a job? I've gone home and told my husband uh, how good you were, you know, how much you knew, how, how great you'd be um, <laughs> in the accounting. So I said, well, I may as well go and, and give it a go. So I went and had that interview uh, with him and another partner and was offered a job. So that's basically how I, wow. I switched So a bit of serendipity so, there. It very much so, and I'm always a big believer in things happening for a reason. So, and I loved it. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm. Now, what made you? Let, let's go to the, kind of the the opposite side of that career so far. What made you decide to sell up five years ago? At, a, at still what I would consider a fairly young age in the industry, you were still sort of in your mid forties or so, or late forties. Um, yeah. And kind of pursue the the coaching side. Why did I do that? Well. I, I wanted more flexibility. I was already doing sort of four days a week and... Um, I was going to say, how much more flexibility can a person have instead of working seven? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so I just, I think I was, I wasn't getting stale, but I just knew I wanted to do something different. So I had engaged a coach in 2008, so nine years into my practice journey, and I really loved that. I loved... Um, loved you know how they helped me i loved how i was able to shape the learnings from that but really from a small to medium-sized practice because predominantly the people that were in my coaching group were all larger practices multi-partner firms so i really loved um that i was able to use those and sort of twist those some of those things around to be really relevant to a smaller to is that when your practice, practice started changing was it basically the the catalyst Oh, I'd probably been doing a lot of work before that. So, you know, probably about 2005, I'd done a lot of things and changed things around. I thought I was as efficient as I could be, yeah. um, you know, quite innovative. And I just felt that I wanted to take the next step and see what other um, other people were doing and really bring that in. So a lot of the things that I implemented in those early stages Smaller, medium-sized practices weren't doing so. Things like the paperless office, things like having the two screens, which seems so common these mm. days but back in those days that wasn't so i was actually taking the lead from a lot of business firms bigger firms and bringing them into a smaller practice and really you know investing in those things what, what was so the, i really love that what was the catalyst for for making it, those changes or just even wanting to go out and explore in 2005 because that, that's been what six yeah. years into your journey now as a yeah. practitioner yeah, so I was growing, growing really well. So that word of mouth was getting bigger and bigger. I was getting more. I got staff. I got an office. I moved out of home. So I had a couple of little. You know, I went out and got a room to start with. I just rented one room, yep. and then I got two rooms, and then I got a bigger office. And so that growth, and just like managing that growth, whilst still trying to have that balance in my life, because you know, remembering why I went out was because of my family, and I felt that I was getting so busy. And I was so, you know, overwhelmed in a sense um, that I was sort of going off path a little bit. So I wanted to get myself back on path, get as efficient as I could be, 
as profitable as I could be and um, still having that work because I was getting up at 4 a.m. every morning trying to get re- work reviewed, to get turned around for the staff, to keep them up to date and wow. get them you know, going with the work, to do then have a back-to-back worth of appointments. So I guess with all of those things, I needed help to find out ways to get me back on on track so and that certainly did that and then we just you know kept evolving and evolving uh from that point so i guess you know i really wanted to to replicate some of that stuff that i was doing which was quite groundbreaking i guess in those days for a small practice Mm. um to then be able to help more people that were in the same situation as me and you know i think 18 years in in you know still doing that on your own solo but then doing all that growth um yeah, I just wanted to change mm-hmm. and knew that there was no one else really servicing this segment of the market. Uh, and even when you think about going to CPD events and a lot of different, you know, resources, everything has always been tailored at the big end of town, you know, at, from a price point, from a inclusion point, you know, and, you know, working with different types of businesses where from a small or solo practitioner working predominantly with small and solo business owners, um, it's a different. There's a different, there's a different synergy there, different synergy, different market. But I don't think they were actually um, ever serviced as well from the providers, and also even from our professional bodies, which you know you had to just sort of suck it up and um, and just learn. Or people didn't do stuff, or they didn't evolve, and they just kept that grind. And I think part of the evolution, the innovation, that keeps you excited and wanting to go to work. Mm. And I, I really can say that even though I was snowed under, overwhelmed, I still loved doing what I was doing in those years. So I, I figured I, I owed it to myself and my clients and my staff to do things as, as best that I could and just keep everyone invigorated and keep moving with what was happening. What was the overwhelm point for you? Was it just a certain number of clients or was it just having staff or having to go to an well, office? Like I, th- I think, you know, you're – conscious of you know making sure that you were making enough money like for for us for our family as well my husband was a stay-at-home dad so again in 2000 that was very um unusual where you know these days everyone is splitting you know responsibilities you know a lot if that's what they want to do so i think you know i had financial pressures to ensure that the prof- the practice was as profitable as it could be, that mm. I could take as much out of it as I could. Um, same with attracting good quality staff that, you know, I didn't want them to come in and feeling the overwhelm themselves. So it was really about, I think at that time there was a lot of clients, um, you know, we were still getting a lot of clients. It was quite often people bringing in like work that wasn't really up to standard. So we were actually, you know, maybe taking things um, – that probably wasn't profitable in a sense of, you know, the shoe boxes, the biscuit tins. (laughs) So, you know, we actually really educated our clients, like this is not the way we do things here. We want everyone on accounting software. So that was probably one thing that I basically said that, you know, if if you want to work with us, you need to have accounting software or be willing to go to that. So I probably said goodbye to those biscuit tins, Excel spreadsheets and a lot of those types of ways of bookkeeping. Um, So I did actually raise the standard of the quality of clients that we had so sorry Amanda was this a gradual process or was this kind of just a one day you had you know what I've just uh, had enough and things are changing and you just went on this kind of steamroller thing and just changed no. everything no I think we I think you know we had a wish list so yes we did sit down and I sat down and said I want to do all of these things over the next 12 months yep. and I actually still have that list here <laughs> that you know I have written and all these things and you know we had dates when do we want to do it by so some things you're right we said okay from this day we're charging x amount for ASIC returns yep and we're doing that from the first of the month next month from here on in we're doing so it was it was still a gradual process because I think that's a thing when you want to still be nice and you still want to, you know, have the respect of your clients and yep. your staff. You don't want to just go and say like, and I understand that from a small practice, people don't want to just go and from today we're doing this and, you know, yeah, yeah no, no, too but, bad what everyone else thinks. But, so, yeah, I think it was, yeah. But more just for you mentally, was it just like a one day where this is too much, I need to make some changes in my life or was it kind of just little gradual and was like, oh, I've read about this, I've heard about this, let's try this, let's try that. I think it was, yeah, I think it was more gradual. I just, you know, yeah, I became to a point where I was just, I was honestly working too hard. Yeah. I was, you know, getting up that early. I was probably cranky when I got home. I was like, what, what, Um, when did you sleep? I was working on weekends. 
<laughs> yeah, when did you sleep then? Yeah, oh, I used to go to bed quite early. So, you know, I would go to bed with the kids. You know, my husband played squash, so the nights that he would play squash, we would go to bed early. The kids and I would go to bed, you know, half past seven, wow. eight o'clock. I watch a bit of TV and then I would be up by four o'clock. So I'm a very effective sleeper. I do everything. I'm very effective with everything I do, <laughs> even sleeping. So I, I've got an Apple Watch and, the, and I have been timing it. So I can fall asleep sometimes in less than a minute. Wow. So... I don't need that much sleep. So, you know, yeah, I, I'm effect- an effective sleeper. So I never woke up really tired. I was up ready to go and get that stuff done. And I'm still like that now. Not that I get up at 4 o'clock very much these days, but I do, you know, get up early um, to go to the gym and then I'll probably get up and say, okay, if I want to do a few things just around the house, yeah. I will go up and say, okay, I'm going to get up at 5.30. I'm going to get that done before I go or 5 o'clock and I'm going to get those things out done before i go yeah can, can, so, can you show your um, sleeping secrets how you become like you know how do you fall asleep in under a I minute don't know. i don't know i just think it's probably been born out of necessity michael because i knew that you know i had to get that so even when the babies were little i would get that sleep my husband would get up and feed them during the night and then i would just get up and then i'd be go 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 yeah okay. so i just think i've just been very lucky to be able to do that and i I guess one of the things, even going back, even when I was studying, I didn't ever work at night. I never did study. I never did assignments at night. Mm. I would much prefer to get up early, you know, being in a house with six kids. And, um, you know, it was always noisy. So I would often get up that early and get things done. Were you like the most disciplined out of your entire family? Um, Probably in some respects. I think a lot of us... Yeah, I, I'm quite disciplined. My one of my brothers um, was a boxer growing up, so he was very disciplined with you know the training, how his exercise regime, what he ate, and I think you know we have an and coming from a family where everything needed to work like clockwork. Mm. We actually were we are actually pretty all, all disciplined in a lot of those. Does it come from role modeling from your parents? Like were they just <laughs> exactly the same? Way? My my mum's pretty pretty organized so she ran a very tight ship yeah so okay. uh so i guess some of those things we all had du- our duties to do in the morning so if someone was on lunch boxes someone was washing up someone was doing <laughs> this in the afternoon we all had our job so i think you know when you want to get things done and you've got a small window you just get it done and i think that's um yeah but i was doing all of those things and i figured that i can't keep doing that i can't keep you know i wasn't exercising i was you know those sorts of things that i think are really important I, even though my family didn't miss out because I would get up early when they weren't you know, awake. But then, you know, once I got home from work, I was all there. So I didn't go back to the office. I didn't do any work. And I think that from a sleeping perspective, your mind's not going. My mind had rested. So yeah. when I hit that pillow and I knew I had to get up, I did it. Do you think, so that's probably the secret. Do you think that's changed now? Like if you were doing a practice these days where there's just a million more distractions where an accountant is on you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook groups, um, you know, they're doing podcasts, they're on media, they're they're also just on phone, you know, like just getting distracted by being human, you know, because uh, mm. all, all these apps are basically designed to make us addicted to them. Is that, Correct. Would that have been a different story? Because you have multiple screens, your, your office is at home a lot more than it used to be back in 2005. Because I remember in 2005, like, you don't really clock on as much as you do these days. Um you know, you, you didn't have a phone. Like some people have mm. Blackberries, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah. I had a Blackberry. I had a Blackberry. But yeah, you know, yes. And you had to you had to go in. Well, to, you know, when we started to get the internet, you had to dial up. So if you were dialing up mm. the internet and being on the internet to maybe do a lodgement or go and look up something, you had to be off the phone. So yeah. none of this multitask. True. Because I remember that. Yeah. You had to a different so, you know, you had to stop. Yeah, you know. And, you know, running from home, we only had one phone line. So it was like, okay, we've got to do a lodgement everyone's off or um, with internet, with that dial-up internet. I guess, you know, there is so many competing pressures, Michael and I, and they're they're not going away. No, they're increasing. They're increasing. And so technology is supposed to make our life easier, but it actually has often, you know, in a lot of cases made it harder. So the way I think to combat that and what I share with my clients is you've got to be able to switch off. So even when you're working, switch the emails off, switch the phones off, uh, and get the work done because, you know, answering phone calls, answering emails, looking at this on Facebook, doing these, you know, webinars, because we could be all day doing a webinar. 
I get so many <laughs> webinar requests. I think, oh, this looks really good. And their marketing people are so good. And I, oh, I want to do that. Yes, I want to do that. 100%. And I have clients saying, oh, I need CPD. I want to do that. Went, you don't need any more CPD. You've done <laughs> how many how many webinars did you do last week? Uh, block, so think, delete, report, spam. Yes. <laughs> So um, one of the things that I do, and I do this now myself, like I'm a big, you know, as I said, that I'm a bit of an efficiency queen. So batching, I batch a lot of stuff, and I did that in my when I was in practice as well. So batch my days that I would do tax returns in, you know, Monday and Wednesday this week, Tuesday and Thursday the following week. So on a two week cycle, I was able to see clients in their desired days but I wasn't going to do every Tuesday. Mm. Um, I would review work and I would have certain blocks to review work because I didn't want to have to be doing that at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I would have days to review work. So they're in my diary. And I think if we actually put the things that we've got to do in our diary and use our diary as our scheduler, and remembering when we're reviewing work, that is client work. That is income-producing work. So we don't need to be on Twitter, Facebook during that time. How do you deal with batches and distractions because your staff coming in asking you questions, they need training, they have interviews, clients going, hey, Amanda, yeah. I'm buying a car. I just, I, you know, should I get an innovative lease? Yeah. Should I buy it outright? Should I buy it in my, you know, my own name or company name? Like all those yeah. calls and emails that have to be dealt with some of them fairly yeah. urgently, some of them sort of within well, a day or two. Sometimes they've got to wait. And I think that's actually something that we can actually do better because we're often quickly answer the phone and we're just like, when am I going to speak to someone? I may as well just do it now. And then mm. they get used to that. So if we then start to change and educate our clients, say, look, actually Amanda can, can talk to you about that. We should get, how about we put some time in her diary? She'll bring you back at 4 o'clock. Or you could speak to someone else now. So there might have been someone else in the office. So we've got to actually stop for a moment and pause and say, does this client really need to ask this question now? And that's where you need a practice it, manager or, or a really good receptionist. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of also explaining to the client they just can't ring up because, you know, you're in the middle of something else. So it's about that education piece. And the more that we just keep going and letting them be the disruptors, the more they're going to do it. So maybe if you say, no, you we can't get on to you to four o'clock because if you're actually working with a client back to back with a, with clients you can't answer that call but just because we're now reviewing oh let's just get interrupted on this client work to take that they're actually become a little bit more organized so they're not going to ring you at the last minute they might ring you the day before mm. or they might ring you and i remember a specific example where someone phoned and said they needed something for centrelink and they needed it today or by five o'clock today and it was actually when my brother was in business with me and i said well look I could have probably gone and helped them. I thought, no. And I said, so that's a bit rude that Centrelink have asked you to do this and give it to them by 5 (laughs) p.m. today. And I said, that's really, really rude. And they said, oh, look, look, actually, it's my fault. I probably should have sent it over earlier. And I went, because they've acknowledged it's their fault. (laughs) So why is it my problem? So I said, look, how about, Ryan's not going to be into the office till Monday. How about you ring Centrelink and let them know that your accountant is not available? and that you that you you've got a, a call book with them on monday you be back to them because you have another week and they did that now i could have dropped everything that i i was i what was doing but i thought no people need to learn to value our time mm. and by us just you know feeding into these people's emergencies it's not actually helping us. So I think, you know, we've got to be, be more careful. Boundaries, so that, basically, instead of boundaries, basically. Instead of boundaries. And when people are coming in, so, you know, I would have my door shut. So if I was reviewing a job, I think it's also creating rituals. So when I was actually reviewing a job, I would put a candle on and I would put some music on, shut the door, and I was in reviewing mode. Into a candle. Why a candle? A candle. Oh, it just smelled nice. And I was like, I was yeah, actually in the zone. Do you have different smells for different batches? Like, yeah. you know, individual tax no, returns, no, no. it was lavender. No, no, no. Business returns, no, no. it was... Uh... Whatever. Usually okay. it was a bright candle. <laughs> Usually matched my, match my uh, surroundings. But now, here, I've got in my office here now, I've got a doTERRA oil diffuser, which is on, so the same thing. I get in the morning and I have a ritual which sort of says, game on. Interesting. And I think, you know, think about whether there's some stuff like that. I also, I don't use it as much these days because I'm so, I'm, I'm quite organized. But if I do need to have something done very quickly, I love the Pomodoro technique in the yep. app, which I'd get a lot of people. So on my phone, I've got the 
um, timer. So 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off. So if you must get interrupted, you put this on and just do 20 minute blocks of work in 10 minutes. Mm. Or you might want to do a 55 minute block without any interruptions and you've got five minutes to go and get a coffee, get yep. a drink and come back. And if you do a few of those a day, you are, cannot believe the amount of work you actually get out. Mm. So I'd encourage everyone to look at that Pomodoro um, technique. I used to do that back in, a while ago. I haven't done it in ages. Yeah, well, I haven't done it for a while. Either. But if I do have something, if I'm you know creating a webinar or I'm you know maybe doing a, writing a blog or writing mm. something, I'll often put that on with some focus music. Yeah. No. What's focus um, music, by the way, focus for you? Music. So for me, I sometimes put Spotify. Usually it's a 70s playlist i love the 70s or or otherwise another one of my apps is the calm app yeah so i subscribe to calm and then in there they've got music and it's focus music productivity music and it's just instrumental but it's really quite it's the it's a, you know quite beaty it's got some interesting uh, and it and it's just like it's very repetitive and it just gets me in the zone interesting okay because i'm like the opposite i kind of have music like i have to be in silence to work so my whole life it always yeah. used to be library like from high school every single day yeah. i would go to library to do any homework yeah um and i've always operated that way since yeah i've always had a radio one so at home when there was so much activity and people coming and going i had the radio on and um i would just have the radio going. yeah so yeah it's interesting because other kids next to me would have their like headphones on and they, would, they could only you know, I could see them doing homework and stuff, but it would always be with music blaring. Um, maybe, mm. maybe it's a product of being an only child, but there's always quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, interesting. You, you also, well, I'm, I'm trying to, I've, have, I've got this image in my head of your staff looking through your window going, oh shit, she's got the candle on, better not disturb her. And then they, were, they, were, they keep checking in every two hours waiting for her to like, basically go down to the wick it's like all right guys in five minutes it's nearly it's nearly there we can it we was, can do it oh i would i'd switch it off i'd switch it off but you know it's funny like if a client did come in that afternoon i have to like try to open the door and because you know like people will think that was a bit you know a bit funny someone having a candle and in, in the counting process but i always you know was it it was a little bit just crystals know, everywhere yeah, no, 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 no crystals but that was a sign and um and sometimes what i did even when i had the had the door open because people had to walk past my office i'd often just have my headset on and clients would just come and wave and i would pretend i was on a call and <laughs> very clever back. very clever and they would say ah oh, you know they wave and um so you know you have to you know you still want to be approachable and so you know i was always approachable and we'd often have um you know we had lunch together with our staff so sometimes they'd come in and say well bring your lunch in and we'll do this work and so I was still very much approachable yeah um but I had to we had to realize that we had productivity and they were the same so one of my staff loved working from home and so she would say at best time can I do a couple of days at home without interruptions so she would take her stuff home and do her best work at home and then she would have to you know be able to be available to answer phone calls or emails but she'd only do that twice a day mm. so she would do that and she loved it and the productivity um out of her like it was great for me great for the clients getting their work turned around quicker but also for her because the piles of, of workflow that she had to do was yeah. getting off that list and that gave her a feeling of accomplishment so it was a win-win for everyone yeah, I can see that happening. Um, mm. You mentioned your you and your brother went into business. What was mm. what was that like working with family or just in general yeah, having a second partner versus you calling the shots? Yeah, yeah, no, it was really good actually. Um, we get on really well. So he's the youngest; he's thirteen years younger than me, and mm. I'm the oldest. He's used to you and bossing him around, basically. Probably used to be bossing around, <laughs> or maybe mothering him a little bit, mothering. Probably not bossing, but probably like mothering. So he's very, very calm, very placid, and uh, so it was really. It was honestly, it was great. So I was sort of mulling with the idea of selling the practice, and he actually was an owner of another practice. And how that came about, I just messaged him and said, you know, and I actually had someone who was interested that, that approached me. And so I'd done a prospectus up and I said, look, you know, can I run these numbers by you? And um, I just, and he said, actually, he said, I'd be really interested in joining you. Never had we talked about it. And it was just like a phone call. And he said, actually, let me have a look at the numbers because I might be interested. And that's literally how it all happened. So you've been and wanting to sell your practice even way back before you sold it, and yeah. So I, was, I actually had someone who planted the seed, and it was someone who had actually had a financial planning practice, and they actually approached me and said they they were looking at, at acquiring some practices to do 
financial planning and accounting. So that's what planted the seed. I'd also went to a seminar. My husband and I had been to a seminar in Sydney um, that was run by Michelle Knight. Mm-hmm. And in that, like about, you know, getting your practice ready for sale or what would, you, what would your practice be worth? And when they were going through all of the, the metrics, and I thought, actually, mine's doing all those things. Mm. And, um, you know, I would actually get some quite good money for this. And um, so that sort of, because I was sort of thinking, well, if I do want to sell in sort of five years, time, I, I sort of thought maybe I'd get out when I was 50, yep. which was last year. So I got out well before that. And I sort of wanted to think, okay, well, if I could do as much as I could to maximize the sale price, to make this a really attractive practice, what would I need to do? And then from going to that seminar, I realized actually it was saleable as it was. And then this person approached me. I'm thinking, this is actually like things mm. happen for a reason. And so then uh, because there was two interested parties, I decided one of them being my brother, I actually put everything through a solicitor, happy to invest the money. So everything went to the solicitor, the prospectus, the finalized prospectus and everything. And then he was the person who, you know, did all the, not negotiating, but sent it out so everyone got it at the same time, went through all the questions. So every, like there was no, I wanted it to be really transparent. Okay. And, um, yeah, then he came on and he bought a pass, you know, bought some of my shares. And then we worked together for about four years until I sold. And that was great. So I cut back again. You know, I was doing mm. sort of three days a week to focus on the uh the coaching and we had never had one argument we were very alike very much obviously because of our ethics and ethos and he just fitted in so well and it was just like it was a so would you recommend like your clients time. bring on additional partners or even promoting their you know existing staff towards partnerships so or is it yeah. easier to just run things yourself because there's you know yeah. There's no compromise. I think it's hard. I think it's hard. Look, and I've been dealing with this with quite a few of my clients that are looking at bringing on partners. And I guess it's, I guess it works. I, I think it works when you've got a shared vision. Mm. When you are very much, you know, I wouldn't say you've got to be alike because there could be, you know, there could be some synergies that someone's good at this and someone's better at than something else um but i think that shared vision that you know whether it's a, a holistic practice of the types of clients you want to work with or the types of like the lifestyle you want i, I think they're the, probably the competing things that when things don't go right yeah. which then it can all fall apart so i think you know knowing and for instance my brother is now in business with with someone else so they've actually combined their practices but Again, the synergies were there. They, they've they known each other since they went to kindergarten together. They went through high school together. One was captain, one was vice captain. But you they hear that all uni. the time when people like best friends go into business together and then yeah. their whole friendship falls apart or family members go into business and then they don't speak to each other yeah. for 10 years. You hear that I, I as well. I think so, but I, I do, you do, you do hear that. But I think you've got to have the, you know, you've got to make sure and set things up at the beginning that, you know, that you are actually really you know, confident this is going to work. And if it's not going to work, you need to be able to have things in place that you can easy unroll, easily unroll it. So what were some of the things with you, know, you and your brother? Because I, I know one of the biggest things, um, and that look, I experienced it myself in, in a business partnership before, mm. is equal contribution in a way, or at least perception mm. of contribution, where mm. one, par- one, one party always feels like they do more mm. work, harder contribute, you know more do more business development etc etc but then the partnership is 50 50 say versus Mm. being contributional based um how do you a set it up so that there is no Mm. either disillusionment or kind of um you know uh, distrust there or anything like that and also how do you set it up so you can unroll it like did you guys have particular things we're here to contribute a certain amount of hours or keep his productivity up and same as you and how, how would you unravel um, that if he wasn't have it, pulling his way well i guess from unraveling it being able to then go back you know so you've got the structure that allows like legally the structure that can you know you take the shares and you take that half over and things like that that's what i mean from that you know that you're not actually too invested if you can't unroll it mm-hmm. uh, we most most things can i mean it comes at a cost though you know with some things that to get out of a, a so is, is there is there an ideal structure then that you suggest to your clients that are thinking um, of bringing on partners in the current I tax think, environment i think it depends on you know the percentages and the equity and, and that sort of thing but you know something like a family trust with the 
with, I'm sorry, something like, you know, a, a company with, you know, two family trusts being the, the shareholders can work quite well because yep. then you can actually still split that, obviously split that across um, because you still want that flexibility, Michael. I think that's one of the things that you still want the flexibility from, you know, income point of view and, and you know, what other people might might need so um you know if you've got cars running through your business if you've got that you know because mm. someone doesn't want to buy this car and i have seen that in the past with partnerships someone doesn't want a, as most expensive car and someone wants this and you know that can sometimes get a bit messy so we chose not to do things like that within our yep. our business so we actually kept those things separate um so anything that went in we we're all agreeing on so i think it's just a matter of like Similarly, with what we talked about with the clients, it's about having the rules and boundaries and some sort of parameters. So you might have from a staffing, someone who really loves working with the, with the uh, staff, so they might be the staff partner. Someone else might do the financing. So with ours, Ryan was more the HR partner and I was the finance partner, yep. so I would do all the, all the, the accounts and things like that. And then we had a, a monthly meeting. So we sort of tried to divvy up responsibilities. So, yep. you know, okay, well, no, that's a, that's a HR issue. You need to go and speak to Ryan about that and leave. You know, don't come. Even though, because they were all my staff to, come yeah. to start with. So then we had to move them across. And, you know, that's not a bad thing because they get to see someone else, mm. you know, in that. So I think it's just a matter of having the parameters to split. And, you know, we'd look at, um, you know, because I went three days. So we equated the salary. So I was three fifths and then he was full time. So, you know, it's just were a matter of looking at that and being reasonable. Was it an equal partnership or was it split? Yeah, I, we split it. So ideally, because Ryan was buying the amount of shares, it was the amount of shares Gradual. that he bought initially. And then when the uh, sale went through, he, he bought the remainder of the shares. So it was really amicable. What do you really normally recommend to firms that are either in multi-partner relationships already or looking at creating a multi-partner? Like, should they all be equal partners? Should it be the <sighs> traditional thing or you just, you know, a younger junior partner which gradually acquires percentages? What, what's the optimal model? Again, I think it depends on what people want. And, you know, we have got a, an issue, I think, and we've been talking about it with um, chartered accountants, Australia and New Zealand, like what do the younger people want coming up? Mm. Because I think, and, and I, we, I hear this, there's a lot of people that normally would have normally progressed to have that partnership to buy buy in five percent, ten percent, and gradually increase over time, but now people are seeing sometimes how partners are operating, the stress levels they're under. Mm. A lot of people don't want to buy into that. People, a lot of people don't want. You know, we all that was what we aspired to be to become a partner. That was like we had made it when we became a partner of a firm, whereas. I think we've got to be thinking these days that maybe some of our junior staff and up and coming staff maybe don't want that. They don't want that responsibility. They may not want to buy into a practice and, and fork out that money. You know, we've got with housing, people are trying to get into the housing market and it's then trying to expensive. get into a partnership as well. Hmm. You know, so we've got, we're going to have competing pressures. So I think there's going to be a real change about that. As far as the, I want to go back to that point that you made about having a business partner come in because, you know, I think a lot of people love the idea of perhaps, you know, potentially amalgamating because then they can have holidays off. They can yeah. do all of these things. And I think there's some great reasons if that's one of the reasons to do that. But as long as you've got, you know, shared shared vision, as I talked about. But I do think that there may be a, a model. I think a lot of the big People like uh, are coming in and aggregators buying businesses, buying practices. Yeah, Kelly we'll partners. See, and yeah, cetera. we'll see. We'll see more of that. I think, and we've seen it in other industries with you know the veterinary industry. Yep. We're seeing that happen. So I think that's something to be mindful of um, as people join. Maybe they want to join a bigger organisation, so they've got all of the admin, all of the marketing, all of yep. the HR looked after. And then I see maybe some people going just one or two, just joining up two smaller boutique practices to still have a boutique practice, but only still smaller. I also think there's a lot of legs behind people have being on their own, having the freedom and flexibility so they don't have to be accountable to another partner, but really getting that practice to really be serving them. So what I mean by that, if you say, I want X amount of dollars, and I want to design or redesign my practice to give me that, yep. that maybe I don't need those extra staff. I don't need all the things that I have to do if I normally was growing, growing a compliance-based business, so I need those people to support me. Do we actually stay smaller and boutique? We have a client base made up of really 
fantastic clients that are respectful of our boundaries, that if we say we're going to have school holidays off or we're going to have, you know, go overseas for four weeks, that are totally on board with that and say, yep, you work really hard, you, you know, uh, you give me everything I need during the year, there's an option if you can set your client base up and set those boundaries up. You you don't need that person to fall back on. Yep. But that, that, again, requires time and, I guess, purpose. So I, I do see some opportunities for that to, to stay smaller, have less clients, but do more for them so we don't have all that admin or not as much admin. So... I'm sort of thinking there's still going to be that um, in the future. There's mm. still a huge opportunity for small and solo practice owners. I know a lot of people say that they they will eventually go because there's so much, so much work, so much legislation, so many new things coming in that it is actually no matter what you do, it's going to be overwhelming. Mm. Like is and can that provide the income you would normally get or what you were getting before is it actually giving you the return on investment that it should be and for some practices i know that it's not doing that so it's only going to get harder moving forward we've got more and more complexity we've got more you know i had someone in my group today talk about cyber insurance and pi and the fact that it's going up so much like Mm. we've got a lot of rising costs in our resources, in our providers and also in our staffing. To get good quality staff, we're going to have to pay more and we already know what people are paying. And, you know, what the graduate market, there's a lot of people that are well above a graduate uh, still getting paid something similar to that. So I think we're going to have a lot of competing pressures unless you've got a model that's actually giving you that income and able to afford you to have, you know, either a good staff if you, if you need a staff member or otherwise you're being able to operate um, profitably. I think there's, you know, there's definitely a lot of redesign that needs to happen. What's the ideal model then right now? Because, I mean, you're, a lot of your client base mm. is, I think, 0 to 1.5 essentially. Yeah. It's a sole yeah. practitioner, similar to the type of business you used to run around the, mm. you know, the one mil mark or so. Yeah. Um, what, what does that model look like in terms of numbers? Like, you know... Yeah. Uh, Say you have a client that comes to you and is like, look, I'm overwhelmed, Amanda. I know you've done it. What, how should I be structuring my practice? How many staff should I be having? What sort of numbers should I be achieving? Yeah. Um, and what are the efficiencies I should be implementing in my, in my practice to give me what, I'm, what I want, which is, you know, you're, big, you're, you're, you're famous for your balance approach. Um, mm. So what does that look yeah. like in a nutshell? I think, you know, everyone's going to be different as far as what they want their income. So I think the starting point is to work out what does the practice owner want as their income. What does it look like? Give me so, a typical average so, thing that you see from your clients. Like what are they What are they looking for when you talk to them? What's everyone, majority, well, looking for? Oh, I, 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 it's a, like how long is a piece of string? Some people are happy to get 50, 80 grand. Really? Some people, yeah, some people that's, they're happy with that. And, you know, and maybe because... And it's 50, 80 grand, that's profit, income. obviously. That's their income from their net practice. Prof- yeah. uh, that's, that's, their, that's, that's their wage, effectively. Yeah. Um, and then I've got some that, you know, want the three, four hundred, five hundred thousand. You know, so there's a real, um, the real sliding scale. But if you were to, like, I think the first starting point is to work out how many, how much do you want and work backwards and look at your costs. And, and I, I think that what I often find, because people say, I need more clients, right? So let's have a look is at that the other. Co- is that the most I'm, I, important issue, like, that you come across? So or? quite often people are saying, you know, maybe I, I, maybe I see the numbers that maybe I don't because they could just be, you know, people just talking, you know, um, <laughs> holistically. But let's say, look, I'm not making enough money for the work I'm putting in, so maybe they're only making 50, 60 grand, you know? Maybe they're making 100, they want to make 120. I need more clients. So then we go back and say, okay, let's have a look at the basic model. I've got a um, on my website, are you leaving money on the table? And I'd suggest everyone have a bit of a look at that because it's like how many hours do we have? How, what's our charge out rate? Mm. What's our productivity? This is the minimum you should be making. And why I say minimum is because, you know, a lot of things, we're not going by hourly rate. It's a based on value. So, yep. you know, a bass might be this or something else is a, a fixed fee and if it if it takes us four hours as opposed, you know, to six hours, we've made more money on it. So I think when people look at that, they actually look at their, compare that with their total revenue and think, oh my goodness, I'm not even making that. So So going back to fundamentals, yeah. But back to the fundamentals because, you know, and then you say, okay, well, based on the income that I need, 
my expenses, I need to turn over half a mil. Yeah. Well, 300,000, like whatever the number is, 300, 500, 600. Oh, are you, are you use a, what, a 30% profit figure? Is that your typical number? Yeah, usually about, yeah, 30%, 30, 33, 35 you can. Some are <laughs> getting more. When people are offshoring, they can potentially get more. Yeah. But like when they go back and do that figure and then they divide that by the number of clients. So let's call 500,000 yep. and say you've got 50 grand's worth of ITRs, yep. so you've got 450. And if you think my ideal client is someone who I do their annual accounts for and maybe I do four buses for or I do their annual accounts and I do tax planning for them yep. or, or whatever combination. And you say, well, actually, I could probably get three to five grand for my ideal client. Divide that 450 by the five grand, and that's the number of clients or client groups you need. And I guarantee you, when people do that calculation, they have got way more than that client. Mm. So, why charging find, them, undercharging you know, them by a lot? Yeah. Undercharging, they've got a lot of people taking a lot of their time, sucking a lot of their time that are on a, such a low fee. It's really hard to get that model and get that leverage from your. Mm -hmm. current client base so yeah I, I like to do that like let's have a look to see how much you're getting and you know we know that say the, the good bad and the ugly say 150 200,000 depending on the type of practice and I know this all depends whether you're regional whether you're yeah. rural and that and I know a lot of people say I'm prepared to take less because I am regional rural or whatever um, but that's you know or I may be working from home yeah. But realistically, when you're working from home, I would encourage those that are doing that to not discount your fees significantly because of that basis because you are giving so much value. You are usually very caring people. You know, you're going above and beyond. The only thing you're really saving is maybe some rent and maybe some security on that rental. Everything, your technology costs the same that if someone had a serviced office. Yeah. I really think too many people undersell and undervalue because of their model that they're working from home, that they're only working part time or, or whatever. Mm. So I'd really encourage everyone to really look at their own model and you know, especially coming up to the new year, having a look to see whether those numbers are actually adding up and are they leaving money on the table? Because quite often they think we need more clients, but no, we're leaving so much here that we're not actually charging enough or we're not actually even delivering as many things as we could for our clients. So, you know, we've got an, a situation where we may have a client, that a really great client that really needs more of our help. So if we said we'll do a budget for you, if we do a cash flow, if we do some charge rate analysis, if we do a break even, if you went and offered it to those higher, you know, clients in your client base, they're glad they're going to pay you a grand, two grand to do that. Mm. But we're not actually spending enough time at the top. We're spending too much time at the bottom. So I'd actually, if you're someone who's thinking you need more clients to make more money, I'd really encourage you to look at those couple of metrics to see whether that's actually the case or whether you're giving away too much of your time. And, you know, when I look at that, that, that number that I do, that leaving money on your table, I only talk about a 37 and a half hour week. When people then plug in, they're working 50, 60, 70 hours and then compare, then compute those numbers and then compare that to their turnover, there's a, often a quite a large significant um, shortfall. Yeah, I remember you said like many accountants that you come across would be better off working for someone else in terms of how much they bring in yeah. with less stress than they are working you know, for themselves. And I think, you know, and saying that with the greatest respect, but I think, you know, quite often a lot of us have left practices. So, you know, even people that have been out, you know, for a, quite a while, like going back to practice, I know it's very hard to think I couldn't work for anyone else again. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people saying that. And if that's the case, don't, but make sure you're getting what you're worth because, you know, this is our financial security and the wealth that we're creating for ourselves and our family. But I think... The conditions that perhaps were the impetus for us leaving and starting on our own, whether that be the entrepreneurial mm. spirit or whether that would be actually I'm not happy with the boss that I was working at, I'm not happy with the extra overtime I'm being given or the expectations, yep. I'm not happy being dictated to or they're not flexible enough. I'd actually get people to have a bit of a look to see, go and jump onto maybe where you worked and um, jump onto their Facebook pages on that and just see what's changed since you've left there. Yep. You know, quite often we've got more flexibility. 
We've got, you know, so many other initiatives that have been, been brought in from a health and wellness point of view that things that we would think we wouldn't want to go back there, maybe it's different. And maybe mm. it's not the same place, but maybe it's somewhere else that you'd go and think, oh, my goodness, they get six weeks holiday, they get this, they get that. I, I think we've got to be really open to options. And I think that's probably a situation if you're looking at the numbers and you're not happy or you're thinking, actually, Let's work out how much I am really getting per hour and how much I've got on the line and how much time that I may be spending, you know, out of, out of the, out of the office doing my work, how many things I'm missing out on, um, how the, the, the deadlines that I've got, the stress that I'm under, you know, is that enough? And if it's not, let's change the model to be that or otherwise maybe it's an opportunity to say, actually, I'm going to do something different. So, Maybe people have actually thought, well, I got into accounting accidentally. I really want to do something else. Do you have many people like that? Maybe that do that. Absolutely. After a conversation, they decided, I want Absolutely. to be a gardener, actually. Absolutely. And I think there is, you know, I encourage people to do that. So it might be that actually I've done, I'm not done with this. And I have a passion. I mean, I have so many people in my group, The Balanced Firm, who say they're really creative and they've got little um, stands at, at um you know, markets of a weekend or they've got an Etsy <laughs> store or they've got some. And, you know, I think there's so many things and people say, if I wasn't an accountant, I'd be this. Mm. Well, actually, if, if you think that you'd love to do that, give it a shot. Um, so I think there's nothing wrong with closing a business down, selling your business. I've got a, a client at the moment who they've had a change of heart. I've worked with them for 12 months, change of heart, and actually are selling their business. And I've actually been able to put them in touch with someone who's actually, you know, going to, yeah, buy that business. So I think there's nothing wrong. They've just got to, you know, they may come back to it. We can always come back to it. Just like I could come back to working mm. for Lawless if it didn't work out. We've always got options. We've got our qualifications. Yep. And I just think, you know, I'm very much about balance and doing things your way. So if it's not actually working, there's, you know, even selling off part of your feet. Say, okay, well, I don't want to actually go and get another stuff in because I really want to work from home. I want the flexibility to go away and I want to go and travel around Australia with my family for the 12 months. Having staff is going to actually, you know, maybe that, maybe you don't yeah. want to do that. So why don't you sell off 50 grand's worth of fees, the people that, you know, maybe other people want. Maybe it's just a tax return, people that are just a tax return clients. Maybe sell those off. You know, but as soon as people put into the groups, we've got some fees to sell, there would be 50 people saying, DM me, PM me. Mm. Um, so I think my message from that is you've got options. You've got options to reset, to redesign, to put up your prices, to get rid of clients if they're not serving you, you don't really enjoy working with them. Um, if there's some work that you're doing that you don't want to do, don't do it. Find someone else who might take that part of your business, whether you give it to them, whether you sell it, um, or whether you just say, actually, I'm not doing this. Uh, there's so many options and, you know, we've only got one life. Let's live it. But do you set them on the right track or do you kind of just encourage them to pursue what they're thinking at the moment? Because I find, you know, so, uh, as you would know from yourself, some days you absolutely hate having a business you hate your job yes. you hate accounting yes. so if if yes. they call you on those days and like oh, man, i don't want to do accounting you'd be like yes. well then don't do it like go and pursue no, your ethics no, no. but other days no. they love it all it takes is just no. like a couple of weeks of good feedback yeah. from your staff from <laughs> your clients etc so yeah. how do you know which way yeah. to guide them because humans are very fickle you know by nature yeah. we uh you know based on our hormones yeah. based on what we ate how much we slept what's yeah. happening in our families our clients yeah. etc yeah, I'm a, a pretty good judge of character. And, you know, if I've been working with someone for quite some while, and sometimes people just jump on a call with me mm. and, you know, they've either been following me for a while, they might have done one of my courses, and they just say, can I just jump on a call for that very reason? And quite often with that, we might look at the numbers, we might look at the opportunities, we might actually look at, okay, well, what else would you do? And quite often, you know, it is a fact where people say, actually, I actually love accounting. I love, I love working with businesses. I actually really, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Okay, well, let's work with that. What could we take out? What are the things that are making you feel this way that we want to get rid of? So maybe there's a, a staff member that's not performing. Let's move them out of the equation. Or maybe it's a certain lot of clients. Well, let's move them out of the equation. Um, and when I have had those discussions and I've empowered and, and helped and guided those clients to change those things and extract the stuff that's actually not bringing them joy, mm. costing them money, co like, causing them to have sleepless nights, 
they've actually been able to really start enjoying and I've got uh, one quote from a lovely lady said like you know I've helped her start enjoying clients again enjoy what she's doing and when she changed you know got rid of she got rid of um, I think it was about 30% of a client base Sold them we, or we just did the, we did the told them so we are no longer no, servicing those, you. Those ones, those ones, just yeah, just got got rid of them. Just what was the issue with them? Was it just very um, needy kind of difficult I clients? I can't remember. I can't remember the exact situation on that one, but it was like okay, we're just. I think it might have been um, you know under a certain level. And I think that's a, a good good um, thing to let people know. Like you know where where do you want to be? Like is your minimum fee for a client? two grand, five grand, and putting that fee, like one of those rules and boundaries, so anyone underneath that, look, I'm sorry, we're not the accountant for you. So we're no no longer doing tax returns. Now, we've had the commissioner come out and say, you know, if you've got a practice, which is, you know, high volume of tax, of of individual tax returns and low margins, there's not going to be a business for three, you know, in three to five years of that. We know more of those individuals are lodging by my gov, maybe if people actually that's the pain point for them in their practice, do they actually use that announcement mm. by the a by you know the commissioner to say actually come and you maybe sit with that now, like not do anything right now about it, but maybe sit with that and say, okay, well, if I was not to offer tax returns um, unless they're part of a group, yeah. um, just like individuals, do I then? look at starting to sell or would I actually do that in from one July next year maybe sit with that and then start working about how you can replace some of that income with your existing clients like maybe there's that side of things so I think it's a matter of like what is the pain and how could that actually be managed but I think this you know I, I'm actually pretty good at and pretty creative when it comes to okay well this is the pain point how can we actually it's not having an excuse but I think people we really want to help people and we just can't help everyone. So if we have an excuse that we can say this is the reason why we're when we change direction or this is the reason why we're no longer offering your service, like we really like you as a person. Yep. But we've actually got to future proof our own practice because you know, we've actually we've got to work out because it's no use them turning the tap off in three years' time and realizing I'm now fifty or a hundred thousand dollars down. That's gonna be more stressful than having maybe a difficult conversation mm. in the next six or 12 months. Like, what do you do? Like, I mean, so there's just so many options. So I, sure. I think... It's just dealing with whatever causes it, the overwhelm factor for you. But if I've got someone who's, like, literally not sleeping and doesn't just does not want to bar this, and I can tell, and I've had multiple conversations, <laughs> I will actually help them move out or and, and you know, move out of that and, and help them do something else. So I think, you know, quite often it's like I really love accounting and I really love what I do. I just this certain elements I don't like. Yep. Um, and, I, and, you know, maybe you get to a certain stage in your career or get a certain age and you think, actually, I don't want to put up with that anymore. I want to come to work enjoying and opening my diary and saying, wow, I've got these six people, you know, I've got these three people in today. I can't wait to see them. It's really going to be great to catch up with them, you know, mm. this year or this quarter or something. I want people to actually love what they do. Yeah, okay. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're guided by that, I mean, we're all going to have our bad days. Don't get me wrong. We're all going to have that. But it's, <laughs> it's you know, but if you're having multiple bad days and it's Months, really causing years. you yeah. a stress, change it up. Yeah, okay. And we, we we touched on, I guess, offshoring, advisory, staffing, mm. uh, a couple of other things. Overall, like you, you, I'm sure you've, over your 18-year career, you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. Mm. What are the ones having the greatest impact on the profession at the moment? You know, and, and what sort of things are you recommending the changes. to your clients to kind of start addressing them or being prepared for them? I think there's some great technology. You know, a lot of the stuff there, I would have loved for that to be, have been around when I was in practice. So things like quoting and engaging software mm-hmm. just takes the emotion out of things. So if you've got templates set up and you've got certain ways that, you know, you're engaging client, you know, they're not going to have fee disputes because they know what it is. They can reject it or they can accept it. I think they are just, that's just amazing. So, you know, I think well, what what, 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 like what are you part. recommending, like, Every practice that you come across, like going, cool, these are the three things you have to implement right now into your firm if you don't have it already. Well, well, I think paperless office, so having everything on a, you know, a document management system. So I went how now in 2008. Uh, But 
things like FYI or sweet files, you yeah. know, having a look at that. Because I know people say I can use Dropbox or I can use something else, but the ability for you to be able to save emails automatically and, and, and for your staff to be prompted, do you want this email saved under this client? Uh, you know, it means that if you're having a remote workforce, not this, this email, which might be very important, isn't just sitting on someone's email. Yep. Or when you're trying to look for something, you're not wasting time. You're typing it in and it's going to come up for the, the name of the document or something inside the document. That is just like, I just think there's so many efficiencies mm-hmm. to that. And clients really love it that you can quickly call up that HP or you can call up something else. So I, 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 I love that. Um, the engaging definitely with the engaging and the quoting because I think that standardizes your pricing and it just makes for that seamless So what are you recommending to your clients at the moment? So um, Ignition yep. or Go Proposal. We've got clients using both. Yep. So those two, I think, you know, you can't go wrong. There's a lot of others on the market as well and, and especially people that may be at a, a really a smaller point, you do that or you try to actually get um, – yeah, some sort of standardization. And obviously, everyone should be, all small businesses should be using cloud accounting software. And I know many people say, well, uh, isn't everyone still doing that? I can guarantee you they're not. So getting people your still, clients like on account, cl- All the accounting, yeah, yeah, the clients on that. So whether they're using, you know, Myob, um, a, a Zero QuickBooks, yep. um, people need to be on uh, on those, um, you know, uh, intuit people need to be on um, those software because I think we have a problem, you know, with that with that pricing model. I often think we say, well, the clients said to us, well, we don't, we can't afford fifty dollars a month, or we don't want to pay a hundred dollars a month, but we'd rather use our Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yep. And you know, the accountants that you know, say, oh, okay, you know, you do that, but that actually costs the accountants more time to actually prepare a set of financials from those Mm. the accuracy of those financials can be called into questions because how do we know that a client as much as we want to trust our clients that they're putting everything on that excel spreadsheet like we wouldn't reconcile that but wouldn't it reconcile with the bank balance uh if you've got clients that actually reconcile to their bank balance on an excel spreadsheet many don't and many don't do a set of financial statements from those because they might be a micro business. Mm. So they'll just do a P&L. We don't do balance sheets. So I would encourage everyone who's got a business, I would want them to be doing a set of financials yeah. because I think, you know, you need to know that. And otherwise, it's things go and, amiss. And it tells, should small yeah. accounting firms all move to like an XPM or what are you recommending at the moment yeah, for running I, their I mean, own I, practice? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a lot. There's, I mean, it's not just XPM, but, you know, all of the, the the products have got um they've got document management systems so yeah all of those should be could be on there because I think you know how do you know what time I know a lot of people don't keep timesheets and that you know especially oh, I'm on, only on my own I don't I don't want to do timesheets and that's probably one of the things a lot of practice owners love the fact that they sat there and I'm saying goodbye to timesheets forever I never once even though it was a big hype you know. Back in 2008, don't keep timesheets. You know, we just value price everything. <laughs> Rob Nixon style. Um, I, I never stopped doing uh, timesheets because I wanted to know whether I had scope creep. I wanted to know the efficiency on jobs. I wanted yep. to know whether I had write-offs on jobs. And that's what guided me. My metrics always guided me. And I think so many people aren't looking at that. So whether, you know, you really need that XPM, you know, accountant's office, um, all of that to actually be able to, to get that information, yep. I think it's really valuable for a practice owner to be looking at their numbers mm. every month to make sure that they're keeping their own accounting file up. So just what they would get their clients to do. What, what was your review focus like as, as an owner? Did you mm. look at monthly reports for all of your staff, all of your jobs? What was absolutely, your process? Absolutely. We used to have, um, we used to do, well, we used to do a, ma- a manual write-off sheet in those days. Mm. So, you know, we didn't, you didn't sort of, you used to be able to write off when you did invoices, but we would actually go through and, you know, if anyone had, they wanted to write off time, they had to come and get it approved. Um, we So at the end of the month, we'd clean up our whip to make sure that, you know, there was stuff that we did, was just sitting there that we weren't going to bill, we got rid of it. And then from that, I would always, you know, reconcile everything, reconcile the clearing accounts with FPOS and whatnot. And then I would look at the productivity report. I had a, it was called a control report in accountant's office. So I could see what time had gone on, Per staff member, and then what was billed, and I could I could look at that, and I I looked at that 
every month. We actually, once we did all the everything, the whip right, well, wash ups and things like that. And I would look at those P&Ls. I would look at my percentages. So I would want my wages to be a certain percentage. Yeah. Um, I would be looking at, and I also would be looking at, and I know with subscriptions, now I get all of my clients to actually not just throw code everything to subscriptions. I have them all sub accounted because I want to see that on a P&L because that is probably, you know, other than wages, that is a big, big expense mm. for accounting practice owners. So I know when they're roughly working out their charge out rates, they're looking at, you know, comparing it to perhaps what it was last year, the year before, and what they might have been getting in another firm. When we're just looking at that figure and we're trying to make a quote or we're trying to, to come up with, you know, what, what our fees are going to be, I think we've got to factor in some way that rising cost of software. Because that actually, if you know, if you're doing something quicker because of this software, so whether you're engaging quicker, yep. whether you're doing all this, um, you know, not, things aren't getting scanned in now because they're all electronic, but we've got to pay for the the DocuSign, the amateur, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, we're not actually capturing that, so we really need to be mindful. Do we need to actually increase charge out rates? If that's just a quick metric you're trying to quote with increased charge out rates to actually have a technology fee embedded in it mm. or do we actually when we're looking at you know trying to work out what are we charging a client or how many clients do we have are we trying to recoup some of that cost because it's perhaps saving a couple of hours yep. maybe more on jobs and when i think you know to that point that we talked about at the very beginning of the interview technology is supposed to save us time and in a lot of cases it is, but we're actually forking out the money, but it's our clients who are actually reaping their rewards of some of that time saving um, where we should be actually looking at that and uh, our, our overall profitability should be improving. Yeah, okay. Um, you mentioned staff a couple of times and obviously mm. sort of the 0 to 1.5 million you're looking at anywhere from, you know, 2 to about 7, 8 staff. Um, what, what are some of the issues concerns and uh, you know you mentioned one of them is obviously raising wages um mm -hmm. but also at that level that you work at i find it's very hard for them to attract decent people that's one of the traditionally one of the biggest concerns like how do we get people to begin with and and now the the part b of that is how the hell are we meant to afford them because they're all asking for crazy amounts of money now mm, how, I know. how are you addressing that with your clients at the moment look i think I think with a lot of small to medium sized practices, you know, very, you know, family oriented, like that's that's why they've gone into practice. A lot of these people to be, be to be, you know, more family oriented. So I think money is not going to be everything for all of those staff coming in, and they're prepared to maybe take less than what they would maybe in the in the city that they can actually be closer to home. They're not doing that commute. They're not doing that hour each way. The ability for them to work from home, you know, a couple of days a week. The ability for them to be there for their kids and to go to that um, school assembly or something like that. I think people are putting, and you know, we, we see the studies that say this, but I know this from being a practice owner that this is these are things that, you know, we probably wanted when we were employees. So. We need to give those to our up-and-coming employees. So, you know, the four-day work week, I'm seeing that worked, working very, very well. We did four and a half days, so we used to close our office at 12.30 yep. um, on a Friday, and we also used to close for lunch every day, which is, is, which is quite unusual in a sense because but years ago, you know, if you went to a solicitor, when I first started in practice, they shut for lunch. A lot of people shut for lunch, so you had to go. And I, I think, <laughs> you know, some of those old-fashioned things – can actually be really good because it actually gives everyone that breather that they're not go, go, go from the time they get to work from the, to the time they leave. Yep. Um, it gives you, and, and I actually really like it because, you know, 8.30 to 12.30, you've got a four-hour chunk. So if you're talking about that batching, it really works quite well that you can go and do a whole heap of stuff and I want to get this done by lunchtime. Yep. You're giving yourself a, a, you know, a parameter to be to finish Do you recommending four and, and, and a half for the work weeks as one of the things to attract staff? So, I think some of that is amazing. Yeah, I think that's really, you know, that is does make people... Um, while pay, yeah, so while think, paying them full time equivalent, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know um, sometimes I've just come back from a CA public practice committee meeting because I'm on that, on that panel and um, another firm there, a New Zealand firm, they're doing, they're getting still paid, getting paid full time wages, 
but they only need to do four days and it's only 32, 35 hours. And they're getting great productivity, great morale, and there's so many, you know, Google, a lot of companies are doing that. I mean, yes, it does. There's there's some trust elements there, but I think if people know that they're here to do a specific task, they're here to be output-driven, that they've got X amount of jobs and you'll get them done. And, you know, you think if you're going on holidays, how many things you can get done because you need them all done before Friday, before you leave, before you catch that plane or whatever. And I think if we've got, okay, you've got four days to get this done, maybe some of those distractions, maybe that unnecessary meeting, we can all that mm. because we're focusing on what we've got to do. And, you know, people will actually, they don't need to be micromanaged. They actually, if they know what they've got to do and, you know, you've got to be organised. Obviously, this is the jobs for you. I want them done by the end of the week. They actually are using that time really productively because, you know, let's face it, we've all got time pressures, whether that be in our office or at home. We've got to get kids at this birthday party at this time. We've got to do, yeah. like if we have, time-driven boundaries, we actually pretty much meet them. Yeah, no, no, it's true. All so, the studies you know, show so that. Why, why don't we, yeah, so why don't we look at doing that? So I think um, we've still got to pay really well and, and I don't think there's any apologies for that. And so if we've got to pay well and we've got to give people, you know, respect this, you know, the well-being and, and be more family-focused, our clients need to work to actually buy into that that as well, which just goes back to that point about vision. If we have a vision that we want to have really healthy, engaged, productive, caring staff members, yep. we've got to actually communicate that to our clients. So, you know, this is part of this initiative. So, you know, if you ring and you need something and the person that's here, you know, responsible and works with me on this job is not there, you know, you can't get angry. We're told you the hours are Monday to Thursday or yep. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I think as long as you communicate and those. And you manage those expectations. And you yeah. manage those. I've only ever found clients to be actually really happy about that. So we closed 12.30 because we did start closing at 4. And the main reason we did that because all of the dramas happened between 4 and 5 <laughs> on a Friday afternoon. So I would leave at 2.30 to go and pick up my kids from preschool and from school and you'd get the phone call, you know, 10 to 5, someone needs, it's urgent. And, you know, so we just said, this is ridiculous. Like, we have been here all week and people just ring it. That's not our problem. So we would shut it for and, you know, we'd had the answer machine and all these people ringing it for, um, didn't realise you closed it for, I need this, sorry, and, you know, we'd have to wait till Monday. We're not heart surgeons, we're not brain surgeons. Things can wait, and if people leave it to the last minute, they've got to have some ramifications. Yep. So then we did the four, and staff loved it, and then we then did the 12.30. So, yeah, of course clients came, and they, oh, forgot you were closed at 12.30, but we'd given everyone plenty of notice, and mm. they actually got used to it, and we actually ended up not having any client meetings on a Friday. So Friday was your wrap-up day, so it was to get the jobs off your desk, to get organised for the next week. So my staff knew that Friday they didn't have to have clients come in, no appointments. Um, you know, it was really about finishing the week yeah. well and getting stuff off the desk. So realistically, they probably could have done them all, in the, you know, to the Thursday. So I think just being really innovative and look at other industries, I think, Michael, and I think that's probably one of the things that, you know, I have done over the years, you know, utilise some of this stuff that we've done traditionally, but also look to mm. other industries and other people, other entrepreneurs, yep. other business people, not in our industry, as sources of inspiration. But how, how so else I think, can you solve the staffing issue? Like, A, the wages and B, the just getting mm. them when you're a small kind of practitioner, mm. either working from home or Well, well maybe office. it's, you know... And maybe it's it's even like okay, it's school hours. Maybe it's school, maybe we'll allow you to have school holidays off. So thinking outside the square, mm. you know, maybe there is more automation that we can do. Like you know, what roles in our business have we got that we probably could automate? We could probably delete realistically. They're not serving us, and push back to maybe our clients. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a bit of an audit about that because you know, staffing is. It is, it's going to, it's hard now and it's going to get harder. So really thinking outside the square, do we need to get, you know, people are at uni and have people coming in? Do we need to look at more of that, you know, internship type things? Um, and then going back to the point that if we don't have as many clients and we service them, we've got, you know, really engaged clients that are responsible, that are 
you know, we're helping them get more financially um, literate and have greater financial acumen, greater mm. um, empowerment for them to do more. Do we actually need as much physical time resources if we're actually not doing some of the things that we've been doing that add absolutely no value Such that as. we don't get paid for. Well, like a lot of the admin, like let's say, you know, clients ring up and they want a payment arrangement. Like we'll just jump on the phone and do that at no charge. You know, those are the sorts of things that I would say, look, we'll do it this time, but, you know, next time, you know, you, you know you can do this stuff yourself. Or, you know, maybe it's like we want to get some information about an award and we'll just, yet yeah, quick sit on the phone for 20 minutes, half an hour, interpreting, then we've got to work out, like, do we actually start pushing some of that back to business owners? Mm. Because I think some business owners get a bit lazy and they just think, oh, I'll quickly ring Amanda. It's quicker. She always gives me the answer quickly. I don't have to, if I've got to do it myself, uh, I have to say no to go to that quote or I have to, that's an hour of my time that I've got to sit on the phone waiting at the ATO. But do you lose, it seems, risk losing your clients or that no, relationship? No, because- no, you can still say you can do it. So, look, we can do that for you, but now it's going to be $165 for us to do that. Mm. You're giving them a choice, but you're now you're actually, because that's, you know, potentially, you know, getting a payment arrangement, it could be just as quick as jumping on a portal. It could be just one quick phone call. But it also could be you're sitting on the phone and you get someone who actually asks, well, this person's already had three payment arrangements. We need this, we need that, we mm. need this. You know, I, I just think sometimes if you actually look at, really looking at what you're doing, from you know some of that client work do we really need to be doing that but yeah about the and other ways just to attract i think you just got to be innovative and you know if you're providing a really fun engaging workplace people there's people that aren't actually providing that so people want to come so you know be an employer of choice in addition to being you know an accountant of choice for, for your clients so i think it's all about have you seen anything that worked really well in terms of how they're actually going about finding people like what, what, finding people. What, what well, if, I think you know things like that. The four hour, the, the yeah. four day work week. I think you know offering flexibility, offering you know maybe you know the ability to to have extra leave and buy leave if that's what suits you know the ability for people to work school not work school holidays so they work school terms. Yeah. You know that's a huge huge benefit. What about to the whole they remote would, working thing? Should they, I think it's you, great. Yeah, are you like have you had clients that are finding having a you know either hybrid or remote workforce where they have I guess expanded yeah. the talent pool to the mm. whole country uh, is Absolutely. working for them? Yeah, I had a client in a, a very small town in South Australia, and he had a a, a client in far north Queensland. Okay, like we a had staff some member. huge, yeah, yeah a, a senior staff member who did a lot of reviewing. So I think uh, definitely. There's an option for, you know, hybrid work style, so so many days in the office, so many days at, at home, or, yeah, remote working. We have so many people who are, you know, wanting to move out of the city, yep. want to have the sea change or want to have the tree change. And, you know, where there's a lot of talent, so let's let's utilise that. So there's some great organisations that, that match employers and, and employees. You know, Pointer Remote is one that I refer to where they've got amazing people um, and talent that can work remotely, mm. you know, on and, and, you know, with the with internet and that these days, we've got great connectivity. Yeah. No, no, um, because we're, you know, we're finding a lot more candidates after COVID, you know, yeah. ended, in inverted commas. Mm. Um they're basically saying, look, their employer wants them to, to go back to the office, whether it's yeah. time or oh, even yeah. three to four days yeah. a week. And they're like, well, actually, I kind of prefer just working from home full time. Do you have anything completely remote? Yeah. So we're getting yeah. more and more candidates like that. But it's interesting that um, there are so many firms that are still not mm, open no. to a completely remote person. Um, yeah. Even and though they had to have a fully remote during I, COVID. Yeah. I think a lot of people say it won't work. We've known that it does work. And I think, you know, and that I think people are really, you know, they work really well under those. What, what are the reasons why some perceive it as not working or have had bad experiences with it? Well, I think they, they think they're not going to work. They're not going to get through the work. They're not going to be as productive. They mm. want to be watching. Um, so I, I think that's you know, easily solved. You give someone so many jobs to do per week and they get them done. 
they don't get them done, we've got a problem. But most people, you know, I think 95% of people will do the right thing and will get through that work. Yep. And why cruel it for those people because of maybe 5% that don't. And if you're the 5% that don't, there's not a fit anyhow, so they shouldn't, you know, there's... And they probably wouldn't have got the work done on. Onshore, onshore or in, in the office either, yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, we've got... You know, people that have issues even with, with offshore people, you know. So it's like, you know, you can you can have issues in both places. It's just really a matter of it. So I think, you know, offshoring, a lot of more people are moving into that. And, you know, I talked a little while about go about, you know, practice owners maybe wanting to, to do that whole, you know, driving around Australia and, mm. you know, homeschooling and that. I think that goes equally to staff members. So if you had a staff member that normally would have had to have taken 12 months without pay, so maybe, you know, had to have saved money to say I'm going on a break for 12 months. Like there's a lot of people in that boat that could actually still be great employees and go travelling. Yep. The- you know, giving people, like what what is it that really makes your, what's important? I think that's a question to ask. What's important to your staff member or to a prospective staff member? So I think, you know, nothing's, Nothing's off limits. Let's have the conversation and let's see whether we can work it out and see whether we can get some metrics, some productivity to mm. to hold everyone accountable. There's so so many opportunities. Amanda, one of the statements that I've had from clients, you know, when we talk about fully remote Australian workers, would be, well, if they want to be fully remote, and I can't have the meeting clients or being in front of, or I can't put them in front of clients, um, wouldn't it? be easier for me to just you know get the same person to the same work offshore for a fraction of the price in philippines why would i employ them remotely if here and pay them the 120k that they're looking for um yeah how do you what what would you say to that i guess you know there is a difference i I don't think the person you're paying 120,000 for and i know that might just be an example that you've used that 120,000 for that actually can really jump in and be a little bit more like you like so as a practice owner we're not going to get that from someone in the philippines potentially Mm. you know they're going to be more i've seen where i see a lot of this work is that we've got um remote staff for a lot of the the grinding type work and you know they're still very good at a lot of other things but you know there's a lot of that stuff that you know we can get done just get just is the, the production and that's that works really well but i think you know even if you've got someone that's actually remote again it's that client communication and education like we have the person that i work with uh, that, that's an integral part of the team that you know works on your work with me they they're in wherever yeah you know mid you know um Far North Queensland. <laughs> I, I, far North Queensland, you know, um, I don't know, mid North Coast, and they yeah. they've gone they've gone there for a, a, a sea change. They want to actually bring up their children, but look, such a great worker, great work ethic, really cares about our clients. I mean, I couldn't let them go, and this is how we're going to work. So we're hoping that you're actually as, in, as enthusiastic about this as as I, as I. And you know, I know we've been doing Zoom over, you know, over COVID. The quality of work, I mean, why not? I think we just have to. And if, you know, I, I honestly don't think people, clients will actually lose will lose clients over that. I think more and more people are actually really happy about not having to come into the office. They're able now to, if they've got some more children, they're able to have a, have a meeting at home with, um, you know, the two partners there and kids, you know, watching a movie or something in the background. I actually feel that, there's so much more value in doing that that you can actually have both people there that's, you know, mm. as opposed to one having to come home and, you know, relay what's been said at the meeting and then ask questions and go back. I think it's much more. So I guess it's all about framing it and yeah. working out like that. Instead of being creative about the story and how you can actually sell it to a prospective um I like the frame client if it's just re- reframing it and just work out you know and, and putting yourself in that situation you know and i think people need to be a little bit more tolerant because you know even if they were still working say an hour why should that person have to come into them for an hour meeting to meet with that client and then another hour home but do you find, well, well, what's, you got- what's the trend now that you're hearing from your kind of clients is our clients want are their clients wanting to see them in person like I don't think I think people are really really happy like I okay. I um, have I've got a financial planner who's 
an hour away. And uh, uh, during COVID, I met, we meet with them twice a year. And during COVID, we met with them on Teams. And then I got the thing, you know, you're due for any, six months in December. Um, what would you like to do? I went, Where, we'll just do Teams. Yeah. Like I'm not driving in there the hour, getting a car <laughs> parking space. Um, usually my husband and I are both home. We make sure that we're both at home to do it. Otherwise, worst case scenario, he's at his office, I'm at mine. And the fact, like it actually works mm. better because to trying to get all of our diaries together, maybe that financial planning meeting is to go to January and then you put it off and then you go, yep. you know, I just think this is the way. And it's really coming also back to that efficiency piece. It is far more efficient yep. to be doing this. And I still feel absolutely connected with that financial planner. I feel absolutely, absolutely you know, trustworthy and I trust them implicitly. It doesn't matter that I'm not shaking their hand. Mm. And sh- you know, should everyone be offshoring? Um, is look, that a thing I, that you're recommending now? It's that's a per- it's very very personal. Some people do not want to do it, and that's totally fine. Some people are all over it. So, I think it comes back to personal choice. Why do they not um, want to do it? Why are some people against it? I think a lot of people, and this is probably you know conversations from over the years as well. A lot of people just are against it because they want to keep the talent here in Australia. But in saying that, we're, we're seeing... I was like, there is no so talent. Much about, there is no talent. We're seeing talent actually not wanting to come to accounting. Mm. And that is... that that is, That's actually... That's the truth. There's people that, you know, they're going to other industries. They're not choosing accounting and we know that for a fact. So I guess the the, the one thing was I want to keep staff here to, to have uh, coming through my firm and I want to actually do this for our industry. So that's been one thing. Yep. Um, one thing, they've got a lot of clients who don't want to do it. So there might be a particular client base who say, no, if you offshore, I'm not going to... I'm not going to stay with you. For those people, I would actually, there's a reframing position there as well, if that's the case, because really, they probably would. If you did it, they probably what, what, would still what's the, stay. What's the reframe that you tend to recommend? Well, the reframe would be something like, you know, we literally cannot get people here. That could be one of them. If that's, you know, in some, some, some either, either we get rid of you case. as a client or we, well, offshore. we, we can't get, we can't get people, yeah. right? So what we have, we've got people here that, you know, where we might have meetings, you know, where we've got, you know, good quality people here communicating here for you. So we feel if we can actually offshore and get more of the day to day processing, um, compliance work, it actually means we can actually service you better because we can actually, you know, the things that we often don't have time for and really we'd have to charge you a lot more um, for potentially, um, I don't know, but we can actually do those things for you. So, we, or, or, you know, it's a, it's a difference between us not, not having the time to do it. So like those cash flows, those budgets, those mm. tax planning, we literally don't have enough time. By, by doing this, we're actually freeing up time so we can now talk to you um, every quarter, twice a year. We've got more time to do that. So, and also from that compliance work, is what I was saying about the costing more, that model, because we are going to have to pay so much, we are going to have to double, triple the cost of your compliance. Yep. Potentially, and that is that is something that we are going to have to look at because if we want to attract talent and ensure that they come to our industry as opposed to going elsewhere, we are going to have to pay more. So clients, even, even without offshoring, they're going to have to learn to pay more for our services because we've actually, you know, there's been such a um, commoditization of a lot of our prices yep. and client so clients need to say okay well there's there are going to be firms that are going to just do the the process transaction type of stuff but our firm is a little bit different maybe that bespoke boutique where we actually do a combination of compliance and advisory we really want to help you grow your business we really want to make sure that you're actually making money that you're achieving you know what your vision and your goals are and we can only do this by actually that model so we can keep your compliance you know, costs as low as possible and then we can do this other stuff. So I think it's just that, yeah, how, and, and, you know, that's depending on what the, mm. what the client, what, what your accounting firm, what your vision and what you want. But if that's what you want to do more of, yep. um, you just reframe it like that. And, you know, yes, you might have a few clients go, but maybe, and, you know, from a security perspective, I think that's probably another thing, but we've got 
and pretty things like practice protect which is probably one of the other things that i do recommend um so we've got practice protect where everything is secure geographically locked certain times if you only if you've got an offshore team and you know you only want them to be working between you know business hours you can lock all that stuff up so we can keep all that stuff safe um so well, I you think can't, it's you can't protect of... from people like i guess screenshotting or taking photos yeah. i guess yeah yeah but well in a lot of those places michael no um no phones are no, allowed yeah no phones are allowed so they're very very strict on that are you recommending but... or seeing any experience like is it certain countries or certain um you know companies that you are seeing work really well for your clients in offshore I've got, um yeah i've got um quite a few of my clients using orange iq um, Orange IQ. And they've been Orange IQ, I've never Yash heard of them. Thacker. Yeah, so um, Yash, I was actually introduced to Yash by one of my clients yeah. who has a team over there. So, so yeah, in, in Yash, where? In... They're India, India. India. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so they're, um, it's, a, it's a more of a boutique, a smaller offshoring. Um, yeah, specializing setup, in Australia. But really and... lovely clients yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so i've got quite a few clients uh using yeah orange iq and so it's yash and he has two other partners so um two other cpa partners oh, okay. there and uh yeah they do they're doing some really good stuff which is nice so i think it's a matter of like never say never to some things yeah. and also you know with that technology that we've talked about or anything like Yes, you may have looked at it before and it was too pricey for your practice model, but a lot of those things have come down incredibly in price. Uh-huh. You know, when uh-huh. I went paperless, it was 20 grand, which was a lot of money. You know, <laughs> now you can, you know, it's, it's a lot more affordable and you can maybe, you know, do a pick and choose and you can have six new pieces of shite, briny, te- bright technology for the new uh, year. So I think, you know, never say never, really look to see what it is that you're going to, you really want for your practice and then, yeah, get it get it happening we don't need to be stuck we don't need to be overwhelmed and you know not enjoying what we're doing because what's the point of that Mm. and i think it shows michael when you know when you're enthusiastic when you love what you do that you know permeates your staff permeates through your staff your Mm. clients the colleagues that you work with and i just think you know that's what creates a thing. So, you know, no matter what those chains are, whether you now want to do, you know, like with me, we had, we made everyone doing electronic signing. Yep. We did this. And, you know, and of course people are going to be a little bit, oh, I really like it the other old way. Well, usually when they do the new way, they love it, you know. Mm. So I think we've got to be brave enough and courageous enough. If there's things that we know are going to improve our practice and improve our lives, we've got to actually have the conversation with clients. And, you know, I've always... Uh, found that we're going to have some early adopters in our client mix yep. and I you know and I can I can I, I sort of pull them out get them on board first <laughs> use their testimonials and you know make sure that we've got that really Social great proof, experience yeah. and yeah and do that and you know then you've got your next lot and then you've got you know so you might have three tranches of implementing something yep. but you're not going to lose very many clients for doing because they tr- let, at the end of the day they trust us it's all a perception and thing that, isn't it just the fear factor which isn't there yeah, and you know, talk to peers and talk to people that have actually done it. And, you know, I know that before COVID, I, I was very much talking about the remote working and being able to work from home and, you know, having everything electronic. And, you know, the people that did that were able to transition very, very quickly. Mm. The people who hadn't were kicking themselves. They'd heard about it. They were <laughs> going to do it and they didn't. And then, you know, then all of a sudden everyone's just adopted. They didn't have those three tranches, like I suggested. They're... Like, now we've got to do it. And it's like, that's that line in the sand, we've got to do it. So I think, you know, look how far we've come because of COVID and use that knowing that we don't need an 18-month timeline to do this stuff, you know. Yes, you might do it with a few clients or you might test the waters. But, um, you know, the main thing is that, you know, you give some of these things a go. Yeah, okay. Amanda, um, just to start wrapping up because I'm conscious of time, What's the best way to engage with you? Because I know you've got, you know, different offerings, I guess, for your for for the community. Um, what's yeah, the best way yeah. for people to get in touch or to engage with you, etc.? Yes, so I'm on socials um, under Amanda Gascoigne on all the socials. Uh, 
So please follow me there to start with. It gives you a bit of an idea on, you know, the things that I actually talk about yeah. and my philosophies and that sort of thing. So I think that's a really nice way because I'm not for everyone as well. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, from an accountant, there's enough work for all of us. And it's really like, do you resonate with my message? Do you resonate with my style? So that's a good starting place. I then have a, a wonderful community called the Balance Firm Community, which um, was on Facebook, but now it's on a, a different platform called the Mighty Network, where it's a really great group. I've got over over 100 uh, small and solo accounting practices in there. So unlike a lot of the other groups, which are, are fabulous, this is specifically for small and solo. So the issues we discuss are the issues at the coal face that you're all uh, going through. So we have... Um, yeah, lots of activity in there. Uh, Q&A with me once a month that people can jump on, a masterclass and so much, you know, if you can ask questions and it's yeah. all these really great things to help practice owners have a better practice and a better life. And that's a subscription-based service, $97 a month at the moment and nine nine seven for the year. And then I have a range of courses and resources which are all up on my website. Some of them are released um couple of times a year some are released just once a year like my tax planning um, course but I do have a power up your profits course starting in January and there's a wait list on the website for anyone interested in that and then I have group coaching and one-on-one coaching so that's just a matter of applying applying for that um yeah, so I've got a wait list at the moment for one-on-one, but there is uh, availability in the, the next um, cohort of group group coaching, which I take on a new group, um, six to eight practice owners uh, every quarter. Excellent. Thanks, Amanda. And we'll mm. put that up on our website so they have the yeah, uh, thank details you. as well. Now, mm. some rapid-fire questions. Mm. What's your favorite mm. quote? I love the quote, chase the vision, not the money, as the money will come. And I'm a big believer of that. Um, You know, when you've got your sweet spot in your accounting practice and, you know, you're in sync with your vision, the money just comes and, you know, I've never had a problem uh, with that, whether it be my accounting practice or with um, the coaching. Excellent. I like that one. What have you read, watched or learned recently that's had the most impact on you? Mm. I recently read Lee Sales' book, Any Ordinary Day, and I actually went to her book launch of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really love that because it's, you know, I talk about everyone, you know, enjoying their life and, you know, making the most of it. And, you know, in that particular book, people started out their day as an ordinary day and something tragic happened to them. And it was really wonderful to read their experiences, how they overcame it and and the things that they're doing now um, to be the best, you know, versions of themselves and to maybe, um, yeah, look at things in a different light but how they've actually overcome adversity to continue to make a difference in other people's lives and, and have a really fulfilling life for themselves. Are there any other books? Well, what, what books should accountants be reading? Or what book would you recommend the most? I really love at the moment, and I've been sharing it with my group coaching people, and I actually got an email about this yesterday from a client who said they've just finished the audio books of these two books, and they were Selling to Serve yep. and Untapped by James Ashford. And I think for those ones, you know, that may be a little bit scared with their pricing, it really gives a lot more confidence about pricing, Um gives you some courage and it really uh, helps you value yourself more and make more money uh, out of your practice. I like that. Yeah, so I think it's really, and I'm tapping the potential. I'm talking about that, you know, resource that I had, um, you know, leaving money on the table. I think it also talks to that. So, yeah, maybe some good holiday books. And what have you bought recently that's had a tremendous impact? I've recently bought a Pilates membership. (laughs) A reform of Pilates? A reformer Pilates, so I've okay. been going there, um, you know, three to five times a week. It's actually and, a good uh, workout, surprisingly, isn't it? It's really great. I really like it. So the reformer Pilates, I go, you know, six o'clock. It's only about ten minutes away from my house. I find it quite meditative. Yeah. You know, when I'm on there, you know, you're doing the exercise. You're just, you know, in a bit of a world of your own. Um, even then, it's sort of not that impactful. You know, you're not actually, you know, mm. working out, but it's actually really good for you. And so I quite like the quiet time. The, yeah, I really love it. So yeah. that's no, I was my surprised. latest I did it, membership. I did it last year. I signed up as well with my wife and it was like, wow, you actually do get a solid burn and solid workout even though you just look yeah. like you're just lying there, you know? Yeah, it's, it's very, ele- very elegant. <laughs> yeah. oh, and yeah. last question, who would you want to have a drink with the most in the world, past or present? 
I would love to have a drink with my 21-year-old son, Dempsey, who passed away very suddenly um, in July this year. So you told me that. What would you say? What would you? Uh, what would you ask him? What would I ask you? What would you say to him? Just how much I miss him and how proud of a mother I was and of him. Yeah, so I just would tell him how proud I was of him and, um, yeah, what a privilege it was to be his mum. Difficult. Thanks for sharing that with everyone. Appreciate it. Amanda. That's okay. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from or some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.